Surat Al-An'am is again the first Makki Surah in the order of the Qur'an. The beauty of it, the glory of it, it was revealed all in one shot. It came to the Prophet Sallallahu accompanied by 70,000 angels, all of them praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, glorifying Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The scholars say that Al-An'am is the surah that mentions Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala almost more frequently than almost any surah in the Quran. So because of all of the glory of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in this surah, it came down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Jibreel alayhi salam surrounded by 70,000 angels glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this entire surah came to him at once. And subhanAllah, it's such a powerful surah. It's a very long surah that when the Prophet sallallahu recited it to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, for the first time, Ibn Mas'ud memorized it right away. Meaning Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu was so struck just as it came to the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu it went from the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the heart of Ibn Mas'ud. He memorized it in the first shot. So it's a long, powerful, glorious surah of the Qur'an, subhanAllah. And it's the first dose we get of Makki Qur'an. So naturally there's a shift of tone. It goes to what we're more accustomed to in Juz'a Amma and so on and so forth. In the last Juz, but in a very long uh, discourse of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala spelling out uh, his oneness and the belief in the hereafter and so on and so forth. So it's it's the longest of the Makki surahs and it's the first Makki surah uh, that appears in the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like we're accustomed to in Makki Qur'an, immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on his oneness. It starts off, Alhamdulillah alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard wa ja'ala dhulumati wal nur thumma alladhina kafaru bi rabbihim ya'dilun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that all praises be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who, uh, who created the heavens and the earth and who made um, who, who made uh, who, who made the darkness and the light and he says that verily uh, those who disbelieve equate others with their Lord so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately starts to stress his oneness and he starts to stress his creation he was the one who created you from dirt from dirt and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qada ajala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, specified a term and a specified time that's known to him um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Thumma antum tamtarun, yet still you are in dispute so it starts off with that tone that we're accustomed to in Mecca Quran Allah stressing his oneness and um, and clarifying that uh, he is the one who creates he is the only one worthy of worship and unconditional obedience and he is fully unique subhanahu wa ta'ala in his names and attributes so this is Mecca Quran and we also see in verse 6, as opposed to focusing on the people of Musa or the people of Isa or anything of that sort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ يَرَوْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِنْ قَرْنٍ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا لَمْ نُمَكِّنْ لَهُمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا لَمْ نُمَكِّنْ لَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have they not seen how many generations were destroyed before them? The people of Ad and Thamud and so on and so forth. This is the people of Mecca, as well as Bani Israel and those nations that were established in the earth in a way that you were not established. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the different things that were sent upon them to destroy them. So this is more than likely referring to the nations that the people of Mecca were able to observe. The destroyed, um, the destroyed nations that were observable to them, particularly in the area of Yemen and, and where modern day Saudi Arabia is. So in Jazeera al Arab, the people of Ad and Thamud and some of the original Arabs, the ruins of those nations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws attention to them, as well as the nations that are mentioned to us, obviously in Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran and Al-Nisa and Al-Ma'idah, um, of those that were destroyed before for turning back on the covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them, verse 7 to 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no matter what he would have sent or how he would have sent the message, or what miracle was given to the Prophet sallallahu they still would have rejected him. Why is that so important? Because you saw it with the people of Isa, you saw it with the people of Musa, you saw it with the prophets of Bani Israel. No matter what was sent to them, they still rejected because they had the diseases of desire and or pride. So one of those two things or both of those things obstructed them from the truth. And there was nothing that could have been different about the message that would have changed that in any way whatsoever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these people, the people of Mecca, for example, they're saying that had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel, why didn't Allah send an angel instead of a man in the Prophet? Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send an angel with the Quran? 
And then we all would have believed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if an angel was to come and he had the book in his hand and you were to touch those pages, you still would have said, Hada sihrun mubin. You still would have said, this is nothing but magic and sorcery. Because you have a disease in your heart. And if you have a disease in your heart, you're blocked from the truth. Are they unable to comprehend the Qur'an or do they have locks on their hearts? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it doesn't matter what miracles given to you, Ya Rasulullah, whether it's the Qur'an or splitting the moon or whatever it may be, a person who does not want to accept the truth will not accept the truth. We see this with Bani Israel, the things that were given to them of miracles, all they responded with was, هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ Disrespect to their prophets and saying that this is nothing but sorcery and magic. They dismissed it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet ﷺ in this discourse, that the other prophets, ustuhzia, they were they were mocked as well. Istihza was done with them as well. You're not going to be any different, Ya Rasulullah. They're going to mock you and they're going to deny you, just like they denied the other prophets when they came with their miracles before. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we go to verse 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا And the day that we gather them all together, all of these different people that worshipped all of these different things, that denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of these different ways, ثُمَّ نَقُولُ لِلَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا And we say to all of those that worship partners besides Allah, أَيْنَ شُرَكَاءُكُمُ الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تَزْعَمُونَ Where are those uh, those partners that you used to claim belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where are they now? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions bringing them all back together, gathering them on the Day of Judgment, saying, where are those partners today, those that were worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And in verse 25, we see the first occurrence of a term that's very frequent in Mecca Qur'an, that they dismiss the Qur'an as saying that this is nothing but asatirul awwaleen, the insults of the Prophet ﷺ, as they said, this is nothing but the tales of the old. These are just uh, fables and fictional stories of the people that came before. They're not real. The message is not real. Musa was not real. Isa was not real. So on and so forth. All of these messages are to be dismissed, and they're nothing but fables. And they go to the point uh, of saying that وَقَالُوا إِنْ هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا dunya. The only life that we have is our worldly life. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُثِينَ And we're not going to be gathered. We're not going to be brought back to life. So subhanAllah, they're saying this after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the day that we will bring them all together and we'll say, where are those gods that you used to worship beside Allah? And here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, it's like calling to their memory when they're standing on the Day of Judgment. Remember when you said that these are nothing but fables and, and old fictional tales and stories and none of this is real and so on and so forth? Remember when you used to make those claims? And of course, here you can tell it's being addressed to the people of Mecca because the people of the book don't deny the hereafter. The people of Mecca were of the very few peoples that had the audacity to say that once we die, we are not brought back to life. Okay, amongst the people of the book, for the most part, there is a belief. Of course, uh, there, there were the Sadducees that, amongst the Jews that, that denied the, the belief in the hereafter, but for the most part, there was an acceptance and acknowledgement of the hereafter. These people completely denied um, being resurrected after death. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very beautifully, um, in, so if you go to from verse 36 to about verse 42, and in fact there's another mention. In verse 38, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, uh, the animals using their, you know, using their natural instincts to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in verse 59, so 38 Allah mentions the animals, and 59 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the plants that all of these follow the course of nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for them. How can you be so arrogant when even the, the, the animals in verse 38 and the plants in verse 59, even they glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their way. They run their course, the sun, the moon, the stars, so on and so forth. All of these things run their course, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their own way. So you know how can you be so arrogant? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are you deceived by what's been given to you of this world, the ease and the goodness that's been given to you in this world? So forget about just the people that have been destroyed in the path and in the past. Think about your own life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, so this is verse 42 to 50, you sort of have the don't be deceived by this world um, uh, threat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ uh, that whenever, when they forgot that which they'd been reminded of, when they turned away from the guidance that came to them, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we opened to them the doors of every good thing. So we didn't punish them with, with, uh, with lightning strikes and with earthquakes and so on and so forth. Allah punished them by letting them dwell in their ease. You know what? You want this dunya? Take this dunya. Take the world. And that's why the, the, the Sahaba used to fear that when things were too easy in life, they feared that it was istidraj, that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reeling them in, that it was a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's abandoning them, right? That go ahead and, and enjoy every aspect of life that you want to. This is what you want. You're turning away from guidance. You're not heeding the remembrance. فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شيء. That we open for them all of the doors of good. حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا بِمَا أُوتُوا until they were pleased with everything that was given to them, we snatched them suddenly and they were left in despair. So even if you felt a sense of joy and invincibility at one point, here you are now, either you found despair because you realized that when the doors of the dunya opened to you, it wasn't all that it was made out to be. So it wasn't worth rejecting purpose and divine guidance for the sake of it. Or death came to you before you could even really enjoy those things in the first place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took you and you were completely left in despair. And subhanAllah, what a beautiful transition point we have here. To introduce Makki Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on the Prophet that really ties Madani Qur'an to Makki Qur'an. That ties the people of the book to the people of Mecca. That ties all of these people together and that's Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Surah Al-An'am focuses on Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam's journey and his natural acknowledgement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the animals recognize it and the plants recognize it, Allah is saying, use your fitrah, use your natural instincts to come to the conclusion of God. So in verse 74 to 79, we see Ibrahim alayhi salam, who's honored by the people of the book, who we've just been reading about for over 150 pages. And we see the people of Mecca now, who also love Ibrahim and acknowledge Ibrahim alayhi salam in a way because of the Kaaba. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, giving to us Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim arguing with his people when the sun, with, with the stars and the moon and the sun. Basically every time he saw the stars, al-kawakib, or when he saw uh, al-qamar, or when he saw a shams, when he saw the stars, the moon and the sun, he told his people, he said, this must be our Lord. Look how bright and beautiful it is. But then once the stars went away, once the moon set, once the sun set, Ibrahim salam, each time he said that this can't be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not disappear. These are clearly things that are running their course as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them to run their course. So I don't believe in these things being uh, God. So Ibrahim salam, was arguing with the natural instincts, you know, that look, how is it possible that these things are God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the the, the, the the hujjah of Ibrahim against his people, the proofs that he employed against his people, and the way that he argued against his people, common sense, using nature's course to say, how could there but be anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating this and managing this entire sophisticated universe? The sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the animals, everyone runs their course in accordance with the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتِلْكَ حُجَّتُنَا uh, This is 80 to 82 now with Ibrahim alayhi salam. That this was our argument. أَتَيْنَاهَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ We gave it to Abraham to use against his people. Meaning Ibrahim alayhi salam was divinely inspired with the argument that he used. And he says, نَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ That we raise who we want. مَنْ نَشَاءَ we raise who we will uh, by degrees, meaning we raise Ibrahim Islam above his people. And he says, Inna Rabbaka Hakimun Adim. Verily, your Lord is all wise and all knowing. So he inspired Ibrahim Islam with wisdom and with knowledge, and he protected Ibrahim and he elevated Ibrahim uh, from his people um, when, they, uh, when they rejected him. So Allah uses Ibrahim as the transition point between Madani and Makki Qur'an, because he is the, the father of the Abrahamic faiths, he is the one who is acknowledged by more people than anyone else, subhanAllah. He is the unifying factor, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, that we have. Then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibrahim, not only was Ibrahim alayhi salam not a mushrik, not only did he not associate a partner with God, and subhanAllah, no, across the board, no one could ever make the claim that Abraham associated a partner with God. Ibrahim represents monotheism. He is the, the embodiment of monotheism. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions, 
in a beautiful discourse from verse 83 to 87, he mentions almost 20 prophets. He says, tell me which of these prophets was upon shirk. Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, Nuh, Zakaria, Yahya, Isa, so on and so forth. Allah starts to rattle off the names of all these prophets and says, who amongst them was on anything but this? Who? And, and you say to the Prophet al these are the fables of old. He is in the long line of divinely inspired prophets that have called people to oneness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, none of these people were pagans. None of these associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once again, he calls to the attention of uh, of the listener some of the things of creation and the bayinat, the, the proofs that have come. And how could Allah have a partner? How could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have anyone share with him in his dominion? Subhana, he is perfect. La to, in, in verse 103, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تدركه الأبصار that the eyes perceive him not. Vision perceives him not. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perceives all vision. So vision perceives him not, but his vision perceives all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever subtle, yet ever acquainted. SubhanAllah. So just because you're not seeing him the way you're seeing the idols or these images that you've drawn or these paintings or whatever it is, Realize that your vision does not encompass him, but his vision and his vision encompasses all vision. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever subtle, yet ever acquainted. Finally, you know, the way that this juz ends actually, uh, verse 108 to 110, a very important lesson in interfaith for us actually, and in talking and doing da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, don't insult, wala tasubbu, don't insult alladhina yad'una min dunillah those who invoke other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be insulting when you call them to this common sense and you call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fayasubullah, they will turn back and curse Allah and they'll curse your religion. If you insult their religion and belittle them and belittle their religion, they're just gonna turn around and belittle your God and belittle your religion. And it's not gonna be a productive conversation. Instead, call people with wisdom and with common sense and with reasoning and with beautiful preaching. Hopefully then they'll come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it, it's very important for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us as we're making these arguments with the people to employ civility. As Ibrahim islam was very civil with his people. Yes, he called them to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he used beautiful preaching and methods as opposed to insults and so on and so forth. So don't be insulting towards the people or else they'll simply turn around and they will insult your God and insult your religion. So that's uh, just seven. Alhamdulillah, Surah Al-An'am is a glorious, glorious, glorious surah. If it came down with 70,000 angels in one shot to the Prophet Imagine the reward when you start to read Surah Al-An'am.